Welcome to another episode of the Swamp 247 Podcast. I am your host, Graham Hall, joined by my co-host once again, Jacob Rudner. And we are here to talk about Florida's roster moves now that the offseason has arrived, is in full swing. The transfer portal opened earlier this week on Monday. And to be honest, there has been a ton of action for the Florida Gators. Yes, some players have returned to the team, notably Graham Mertz. Several other players obviously still have some decisions to make here in the coming weeks, but mainly in today's episode, we are going to talk about the attrition that has happened to the Florida Gators roster, as well as some targets that are that you know under examination by the Gators, it's starting with this weekend, a critical one for official visitors, not just at the high school level, but also those in the transfer portal. We're going to talk about that in more today. We'll start with the big news of the week yesterday, the decision of running back Trevor Etienne to enter the transfer portal. Jacob, this was one that was dragged out a little bit. I think that there were rumors and speculation dating back to last week. We had reported over at Swamp247.com that there was a meeting between Trevor Etienne and the coaching staff where they were trying to figure out a return for him. But as you noted over at Swamp247, this was a decision for a guy that wants to win right now and Florida coming off a five and seven finish, he didn't believe that they were in a position to do that, especially with how daunting next season's schedule is with Florida set to face 11 power five teams. Jacob, just how critical of a loss is Trevor Etienne for the Florida program? Well, I think it's, it's pretty obvious how big of a loss it is. This is a guy who's rushed for over 1400 yards over the last two seasons led Florida in rushing touchdowns this past year with eight. was Florida's one of Florida's highest-rated uh, offensive players, according to Pro Football Focus. Uh, 24-7 Sports has evaluated him to be among the top players, regardless of position, to enter the transfer portal at 12th overall. Uh, as we record this on Friday, December 8th, you know, in the early afternoon. So, you know, you hear the rankings now. Uh, they could change at any moment, just with guys entering the portal at, at, at breakneck pace. Uh, but there's no... You know, there's really no overstating this loss for Florida. You you have your top playmaker on offense outside of maybe Eugene Wilson. Ricky Pearsall is out of eligibility. Uh, looking forward to next year, a year that I think we can all agree between you and me, Graham, and those of you listening, uh, that will be critical for Billy Napier, who has to go eight and four in 2024 just to get above 500 in his career at Florida. Uh, and you lose a guy like Trevor Etienne, who was as productive as he was for the Gators this past year. And it absolutely changes the trajectory, in my opinion. You lost a guy who is a proven successful uh, piece of your roster. I think Florida's running back room is markedly worse without Trevor Etienne. And barring a really splashy addition via the NCAA transfer portal, I don't see Florida being able to get that unit back to the pace that it was in 2023. And that's scary. I mean, Florida had offensive line issues that ETN was able to overcome when he was able to get the ball. Uh, I, I thought that Florida underutilized ETN throughout the 2023 season. There are a lot of people who try and refute that point uh, by pointing to the fact that he had the same amount of carries as Montreal Johnson. Frankly, I don't think it should have been that way. I think Trevor ETN should have been on the field a lot more. I think Trevor ETN should have had the ball in his hands a lot more than he did. Uh, just three games throughout this season in which he touched it. 15 or more times, and those were his best games easily. Almost half of his rushing yards uh, and five of his eight total rushing touchdowns spread across those three contests. Uh, a premier player and, and somebody who uh, will make another program better. And we've heard rumblings that that could be Georgia. We've heard rumblings that he could go back uh, to his in-state home school and, and go to LSU. Uh, so this is a player who will remain in the conference, and I, I foresee – him potentially having a, a, a great game against the Gators next year. This is a, a monumental loss and one that I think really speaks to uh, Florida's issues right now and, and its trajectory in general. Yeah, I've heard the argument from people that where ETN needs to improve is as a pass blocker, needs to improve in pass protection. And we've covered on this podcast a lot that the Gators lacked continuity along the offensive line. They really struggled to protect quarterback Graham Mertz. And then in the final five quarters of the season, Max Brown. And that may have led to the coaching staff choosing to diminish ETN's role rather than have him out there for 15, 20 carries a game and have him out there for the majority of snaps. I, I think that that glaring weakness for him 
was a contributing factor. And obviously Florida's offensive line, and that status was a, an impact on him not having as large of a role as many people would have liked. And now he's going to head somewhere else, potentially in the SEC, as you noted, where the Gators could end up facing him in 2024. It's definitely a blow to Florida's offense. And it wasn't the only one that the Gators suffered over the past week. It was, I think, a little bit of an expected one, but I was not expecting Caleb Douglas actually to enter the NCAA transfer portal. He was a guy who had a really promising finish to his freshman season in 2022, was a starter for Florida for the first five games of the season, gets injured on September 30th against Kentucky, was initially supposed to be, it seemed four to maybe six weeks would have got him back towards the end of the season. Caleb Douglas doesn't see the field for the rest of the year, and he opts to enter the NCAA transfer portal. This one was a little bit of a surprise to me, Jacob, but just like ETN, it's a guy who had production within this offense, was a young guy, an underclassman, someone who signed with Billy Napier, and now is potentially going to go to another SEC school. I think we'll have to see how his offer list shapes up a little bit, but in my mind, that's a loss for Florida. How did you react to the news that Caleb Douglas was going to depart Gainesville? Yeah, I I don't know that that's the biggest deal for the Gators right now. I, I don't know that that hurts them in the worst way. Uh, do I think that they should have lost Caleb Douglas? Would I have wanted if I was you know on staff at Florida to hold on to a guy like Caleb Douglas? Probably. I, I think that he's a talented deep threat wide receiver at a minimum. He's a guy who's new to the position, has a lot of developing to do, uh, and showed some really encouraging signs early on in his career as a wide receiver, as a former quarterback, uh, that were enticing. Do I think it's a back-breaking loss for Florida? No, probably not. I, I mean, I would imagine that there are uh, several options in the transfer portal who will become available and, and are within reason for Florida to be able to obtain uh, who could easily serve in the role that Douglas may have been projected to serve in in 2024. So I think that that's kind of one of those losses that's that's reasonably fixable for Florida. Uh, is it possible that Florida maybe even was, uh, you know, pushing him out? Maybe. Uh, you know, I think Caleb Douglas is somebody that could go either way for me. I, I, I do believe, again, that uh, he's somebody who is replaceable. Uh, in the transfer portal. That being said, I, I think that Caleb Douglas falls into a category for me uh, of guys who you won't really know how much their absence hurts you until we know how they're going to fill the spot. So, you know, if, if Florida struggles to go into the transfer portal and obtain somebody who is going to adequately fill in as a deep threat wide receiver in Florida's offense, that would make the loss of Caleb Douglas look a lot worse. Uh, you know, if, if they are able to, uh, if they aren't able to do that, it, it's bad if you are able to do it. Again, I think that that kind of cleans up that situation for them a little bit. Uh, it probably mitigates the, the the challenges that come with losing a guy like Caleb Douglas outside of like the scheme fluency that Douglas had being a, a potential third year player at Florida, whereas any newcomer will obviously have to learn the system for the first time. Uh, but but not somebody I think is is the biggest deal uh, to no longer be on the Gators roster. And as they kind of try and reshape things, uh, there will be casualties like that. I think that there were uh, some other names, uh, you know, among the departed for Florida, uh, who I think are a lot bigger of a deal at this time. Yeah, that leads us to the next one, which I think is inarguably, at least in my mind, is the most surprising one to enter the transfer portal for the Florida Gators. And that is Princely Uman Mielen. I think most of the speculation around and surrounding Princely for the last year was, would he be a guy who heads to the NFL after his fourth season at Florida? I think certainly his production was intriguing, not quite first round type production, but I could see an argument where the guy ends up going in the first two rounds of the NFL draft. I know that some sites projected him as a top 50 player if he were to grade out well and test well in the NFL um, combine, but he now enters the transfer portal. Quite surprising one, um, in my opinion, Jacob. He was at the Alabama Georgia SEC championship game. I would not be shocked if Princely winds up in the SEC for his fifth season. What did you make of Princely Umemielan's decision to leave Florida? Did that surprise you as much as it shocked me? Yeah, it certainly did. And I, I, look, I, was I anticipating Princely to be back at Florida in 2024? No, I, I was certainly leaning towards, like you said, uh, him entering the draft and, and foregoing his remaining collegiate eligibility. So you know, as, as I was looking forward to the Gators' 2024 roster, I'm not sure that I was including 
princely among those people. That being said, I don't think that that alleviates the loss necessarily. I think that the circumstances change based on Uman Mielin's announcement, which is that he does feel as though he needs more collegiate development. And based on his decision to enter the transfer portal, to me, that's indicative of the fact that he doesn't believe that Florida is the place for that to occur. Uh, and, and he doesn't believe necessarily that Florida is able to get him to the level that he needs to be able to get to in order to continue that development uh, and, and maximize his NFL draft potential. Uh, and that's alarming to me. Prince Lee was one of the best pass rushers in the country this past season. There are people who are trying to refute this. You know, I've seen uh, some arguments made that, you know, it's an addition by subtraction and, and Prince Lee Uman Mielin wasn't a 100% great effort guy. And I will say this, you know, I, I do think that Prince Lee struggled against the run. And I would say that there were times throughout the season where you wish that you got a little bit more out of him uh, from an effort perspective. And I would imagine that that was a limiting factor in the, dra in the draft feedback process. So uh, were there knocks on Prince Lee? Absolutely. However, this is a guy who markedly led Florida in quarterback pressures last year. He had over, it was almost double the next closest player. Caleb Banks ranked second on the team in the category and, and Prince Lee Uman Mielin doubled him up. Uh, he ranked fourth in the SEC in total quarterback pressures throughout the season. He was among the top 10 players in the country uh, in, in just pure win rate along the defense, along the offensive line. Uh, this is, this is a guy who is extremely effective. And I think is somebody who maybe even played out of position last year, having to have had some coverage responsibilities. He dropped back into coverage on 23% of his total passing down reps. It's just not the role that your six foot five, 260 pound defensive end is built for. Uh, I think we saw Princely succeed when he was asked to rush the passer. Uh, I think we would have seen him do even more of that if he was in the right role, but depth restrictions kind of limited that throughout the season for Florida and, and forced them essentially to make him an outside linebacker, which is just not where he belongs. Um, it, it's another bad loss. It's another top 10 player at the moment in the NCAA transfer portal among non-quarterbacks. And that makes two off of the Gators roster in the last 48 hours from when we're recording this. So uh, yeah, surprising. Uh, I would say if you're Florida, pretty disheartening because again, I think it's a reflection of his thoughts on your player development and whether or not they were going to be able to get him ready uh, for the NFL draft, be it this next cycle or the cycle after that. Uh, and, and you lose your most productive pass rusher as well. And, and I would say this too, as you're trying to build a program and demonstrate improvement, you can't be trading talent. And what I mean when I say that is you can't be having your best players exit the system and then having to replace them over the off season. Florida needs to be stacking talent and, and that can't be a revolving door situation. It has to be princely stays and you add, you know, another effective pass rusher who can play opposite him or who can spell him. It's adding you know, an effective pass rushing defensive tackle, which Florida did not have in any sense last year. Like I said, Caleb Banks was Florida's second best pass rusher just in terms of pressures generated. And he wasn't even in the ballpark of what Princely was able to generate last year off of the edge. And so, uh, you know, his loss puts Florida in a situation where it's going to have to replace him. Uh, and to me, that's just trying to return to the level of talent that we saw last year. Um, and, and again, I just think it's a, it's a really tough blow. Uh, to a roster and a program that, in, in my opinion, is not in a great place right now. Yeah, I didn't understand a ton of the criticism for Princely throughout the season. I mean, if you watch the film, he's clearly Florida's most effective pass rusher, and he's often being doubled at the line of scrimmage, especially on you know by the right side of, of an offensive line, and is still able to consistently win his matchups. And you, yeah, you hit the nail on the head with his role change this season, playing that edge jack linebacker type position. He's a he's a true rush end in my guy and having the guy drop into coverage nearly a third of the time is going to, I think, cause him to be fatigued at a little bit of a higher level. And it's going to cause a decrease in the effectiveness of his play. And, and so I do think that, yeah, were there times where he maybe took plays off or didn't give 100 percent effort? I think he would agree with that. But what he was being asked to do, it was very similar in my mind to Jervon Dexter from a year ago where you saw someone playing so many reps and being asked to do so much that fatigue was a factor, especially later in games and towards the, the latter half of the season. This would have been a different situation, I think, if Florida was able to retain Antoine Powell Ryland Jr. after spring practice, who had a monster season at Virginia Tech. And if 
Florida didn't suffer an injury to Justice Boone. I think that that would have improved things as well. But obviously, those those weren't how things went down for Florida, and they did have to rely on Princely at a high rate. Losing him definitely is a blow to this Florida team in my mind. And like you mentioned, he's not the only defensive lineman that the Gators are going to lose. Chris McClellan entering the transfer portal as well. And, you know, you saw within a matter of hours that the power five offers were flooding in from McClellan from, uh, you know, Texas to, uh, you know, Florida state offered him as well. This is a, another young guy that you didn't want to lose. And I, I think that it, it brings us to our next point, which how much do we think these moves are impacted by the lack of position coaches right now? Princely Umen Mielen insinuated upon entering the portal that maybe he would change his mind and return to Florida if the Gators made the right hire at the defensive line position coach. As of Friday afternoon, that role has not been filled to our knowledge, and that leaves the Gators without a valuable recruiter, not just for current guys in the transfer portal, but for some of their own players. Am I wrong, Jacob? Do you think that that is absolutely a significant factor in some of these decisions for players such as McClellan and Princely to enter the portal? I think it could be. Uh, I, I, I do wonder how much of it is who was fired. You know, Florida got rid of defensive backs coach Corey Raymond and, and defensive line coach Sean Spencer. Were some of these guys heavily tied to those coaches and felt as though once they were gone, maybe they didn't want to be at Florida anymore? I, I do think that that's a possibility. Is it a possibility that these, these guys don't know who's going to coach them next year and that's a motivating factor in wanting to leave? Sure. Um, I also have to just throw out there and wonder if it's just a matter of not loving the direction of Florida. I, we would be remiss not to acknowledge here that Billy Napier is 11 and 14 in two years as Florida's head coach. We have not seen terribly encouraging results, in my opinion, at least, at, really at any point. I think we've seen some flashes of some good things. But to me, when you lose you know, 14 of your 25 games over your first two seasons, and including five to close out your second year, those feel more fluky to me than they did really truly signs of bright spots. And so uh, were these guys maybe trying to find places where they could go win? You know, we mentioned with Trevor Etienne that that was absolutely a factor. And, and I believe that to be the case with some other guys as well. I think that Florida had players who are now in the NCAA transfer portal or who are weighing entering the NCAA transfer portal or who are looking for spots to A, go and win some football games and guarantee that you're going to be able to do that. B, find and put yourself in a, in, a, in a better positional situation where you're going to be used in a scheme that's going to agree with you. I know that Trevor Etienne, to, to continue to go back to him, one of the factors that led to his entrance into the portal was the fact that he didn't want to split carries anymore. and He didn't feel as though Florida utilized him adequately. And he wanted to go find a school that he felt like was going to be able to do that. And so I think that there are a lot of things that go into this. I think NIL is a factor as well, uh, which isn't to say that Florida is in a bad spot necessarily. I think that the return of Graham Mertz, you know, at least to some degree speaks to the fact that Florida's NIL is at least in a decent spot because retaining an NFL caliber quarterback is not cheap in today's day and age. But the reality again is Florida isn't in a great position and it hasn't been in some time now. And I don't know that we've seen the signs yet that this is going to be moving in the right direction. And whether those lack of signs or the fact that we don't know who they're going to hire to go back to your question, whether that's just the fact that the roster produced a five and seven record and missed a bowl game last year. And a lot of it's going to be returning next year. And the Gators are simply going to get younger. They're bringing in 19 true freshmen and there are growing pains that have come with that. I, I mean, we know that Florida is planning on counting on some of those guys. That is a challenge playing freshmen. And, and the excuse that Florida is young is drying up rapidly, if not already done. So uh, I, I think that Florida has a lot to figure out. I think that there are some players, uh, and I'm not necessarily speaking for these guys or saying that this is exactly what led to it, uh, but I would imagine that at least to some degree, part of their consideration was that they just didn't want to be a part of those growing pains, that they wanted to go find a situation that was stable and ready to go. And frankly, I would understand that. And so uh, I, I don't know 100% that the lack of coaching hires is what motivated some of these entrances into the transfer portal. Uh, would I say that it's a part of it? Yes. Uh, but I think there's a lot going on outside of the that scope, Graham, that, that probably contributed as well. Yeah, each situation is different. Not every situation is cut and dry. Some of these are personal decisions. They're complex. 
things at home that we don't even know about that are motivating some of these decisions. And so I do think that there is a part that we can speculate, absolutely, but no one I think knows, except a lot of these individuals, what the true reason was for them choosing to enter the portal, but obviously they have done so. And you mentioned Florida relying on a significant amount of freshmen in 2023. We saw that was indicated throughout the year, and it was given further credence when Florida had four freshmen named to the AP All-SEC team. Obviously, they're going to be freshmen and just underclassmen in general that are going to be playing some significant roles next season for the Gators. But if Florida wants to have improvement on the field, I think we understand that they're not going to be able to rely solely on freshmen and sophomores next year. They're going to need to add players with experience to the roster, and they're going to need to do it right now. Even though they don't have two position coaches on the staff right now, we know that Florida is hosting visitors and making a a full push for a lot of guys, official visitors on campus arriving today, Jacob, by way of the transfer portal. Just let's briefly go over who Florida is hosting and who fans should watch out for. Obviously, more information over at swamp247.com, so make sure you check that out and subscribe. But, Jacob, just who should fans be looking forward to Florida hosting this weekend? Yeah, before I get into that, I I do want to echo something that you just said, which is that if you are looking for the most information on what Florida is doing in the transfer portal and its offseason pursuits, the best way to stay in the loop on that would be to subscribe to swamp247.com. That's where we're giving most of our information most of the time. You know, these podcasts... Uh, we we can only include so much in these and we only do them so often, uh, but we are constantly pushing out new information, be it in stories or just simply on the message board where we're able to interact with you and answer your questions. Uh, that is 100% the best way to get your Florida information. So if you're looking for that, uh, I would highly suggest subscribing to swamp247.com. We usually always have uh, a great deal as well where you're able to uh, you know take advantage of some, some discounts Uh, on a VIP membership. So I would highly recommend that. That being said, uh, there are four players who are expected to visit Florida uh, starting Friday, December 8th through Sunday, December 10th from the transfer portal. And I'll just name them off the bat before getting into them a little bit. Uh, That would be Penn defensive lineman, Joey Slackman, Pitt defensive lineman, DeAndre Jules, Oregon defensive back, Triquez Bridges, and former Wisconsin wide receiver, Tremere DK. Uh, All four are expected, some of whom Actually, as we're recording this, have already arrived in Gainesville. I believe Slackman uh, ended up in town at about 1 p.m. Eastern time on Friday uh, to get his visit underway, and the rest should be there shortly after. Um, All of them are solid. I will start with the guy who I think is better than solid, and that's Joey Slackman. Uh, The former Ivy League defensive lineman was an all-conference player last year. 50 total tackles, four and a half sacks, uh, highly coveted in the portal. Florida is one of many Power 5 programs that quickly got involved. Uh, He was offered by the Gators almost immediately as a graduate transfer. And and do remember, graduate transfers can enter the portal prior to that early winter start period that underclassmen or ungraduated players have to wait for to officially put their names in. So a guy like Slackman, uh, Jules, Bridges, uh, and I believe actually even DK uh, are all graduates. And so Florida has had an extended opportunity to start that relationship uh, and to get to know these guys and begin their recruitments. Slackman in particular, is somebody who that applies to. The Gators have been in touch uh, well beyond the start of the winter portal period, and he's been you know, pretty receptive to that contact. He's, he's informed us directly at Swamp 247 uh, that he's been interested in what Florida's had to say. He's been eyeing a visit to Gainesville for some time now, and now that's happening. So I think uh, that would be a priority person, in my opinion, for the Gators to try and land this offseason. Uh, secondary to him, DeAndre Jules will be in town. Also a good Bear, but less experienced. Last year was his most productive year as a fifth-year senior at Pitt. Uh, played in all 12 games, started six of them. Not necessarily such a productive pass rusher or tackler in general, but one thing he does really well is occupy gaps and stop the run. And Florida was really missing that last year throughout the season. Not really any consistency in those areas that was particularly apparent uh, in games against Kentucky, for example, where uh, Ray Ray Davis was able to run for, what was it, 280 yards in that game. It was a one of the most one of the most prolific rushing performances in the history of the SEC. Florida needs to stop that this year, and a guy like DeAndre Jules could certainly be helpful. Uh, Triquez Bridges, an interesting case. Uh, this is kind of more of a scout uh, on teams' parts that are going to choose to pursue him. Some projecting will have to occur here. He was a starter in 2022 with the Ducks, 
lost that job in 2023 and was more of a reserve, recorded just 16 tackles, but was productive as a pass defender, broke up four passes last season, uh, solid player with one year of remaining eligibility. Florida's thin now uh, in that secondary, particularly at the safety position. And one thing to note about Bridges, uh, can play safety, can play corner, and I think most importantly for the Gators, can play star, uh, which is an area that they're going to need to bolster as they move forward into 2024. And then lastly, Chimera DK, a wide receiver out of Wisconsin, not very productive in 2023 with the Badgers, but notably uh, quite productive, over 600 yards and six touchdown receptions in 2022 when Graham Mertz was his quarterback up in Madison. Uh, Florida could pursue this to try and create a reunion. I'm certain that Graham Mertz uh, is probably in there vouching for his number one receiver from two years ago uh, after losing his number one receiver from this past season in Ricky Pearsall. Uh, could get a guy who's familiar with with DK and maybe get that connection going again. So uh, those are the four that will be in Gainesville this weekend. If you ask me right now uh, who I thought Florida had the best chance at landing among those guys, I would take the low-hanging fruit uh, and tell you that it's the former Badger, DK. Uh, just familiar with Mertz. He knows what he's got in his quarterback. Uh, and if Florida does choose to take him, I would say that that could wrap up pretty quickly, actually. Yeah, you know, I, I assume that Mertz is vouching for that Florida staff as well, even though a lot of people may be a little bit pessimistic about the direction of the program. I think if there's anyone who has said that he is thrilled with Billy Napier and the second chance that he has gotten in the SEC, it's Graham Mertz. So I do definitely think that will help if the Gators choose to pursue DK. If you can't tell, Jacob does a fantastic job covering the transfer portal. Blake Alderman has you covered with recruiting. The Gators are also hosting official visitors from the high school ranks this weekend. So make sure, like Jacob said, go to swamp247.com and get all the information on Florida's recruiting moves this weekend. But for now, that's going to do it for us for this episode of the Swamp 247 podcast. 12 days until early signing day. It's no doubt going to be hectic for the Gators. Make sure, again, you stay tuned to Swamp 247. For Graham Hall and Jacob Rudner, we'll see you next time.